the main reason for taking up this topic uh, is as FPGA has become or becoming a crucial part of almost every complex electronic systems these days and, and also there is a kind of a growing demand for uh, conducting early design explorations of FPGAs for meeting performance and power metrics as early as possible in the design process. So that is the major motivation for taking up this particular uh, topic uh, for this webinar. And uh, before we get started with um, today's talk, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate uh, in this event itself. You can actually see a control panel, something like this, on your uh, desktop on the right-hand side. So whenever you have a questions, you can go ahead and type in your questions in the chat window. Uh, we have people in standby, and they'll be answering your questions. And, and also, I will be answering uh, most of the questions during uh, uh, Q&A session as well. Uh, Within 24 hours, we will be sending a follow-up email with a list of questions and answers uh, that those have been asked during this particular uh, event itself. Feel free and uh, uh, post your questions during your uh, well during this webinar itself. For those of you just joining us, welcome to uh, today's webinar on architecting. Uh, your FPGAs or Zinc 7000 FPGAs to meet your performance and uh, energy consumption requirement itself. Um, my name is Ranjit and I'm your host for today's event. So during this event or during this webinar, I'll be talking about how early design explorations of Zinc 7000 can help in understanding implementation possibilities and also architectural issues itself. We shall also see how a simulation model of Zinc 7000 can help in making hardware software partitioning and also understanding the impact of application performance and power consumption of, of, your, complete, of your application itself. We shall also go over a few simulation models, including a system model uh, to architect an image uh, processing platform and, and uh, networking system, things like that. I'll be showing a couple of demo examples as well to give you a feel about how uh, system models are constructed and how easily you can change configurations of those simulation models to conduct varieties of uh, uh, design decisions uh, before going and writing an RTL code or writing an application software itself to run on an uh, Zinc 7000 or similar FPGA platforms. So uh, for those of you who has not heard about um, Robles Design or Visual Sim, we are based in Silicon Valley and we are a company providing systems engineering software and solutions for architecture exploration, power and performance analysis of your know, proposed systems. Or kind of complex electronic systems, I would say. And these systems could include a very complex avionic systems or uh, defense systems or automotive systems, things like that. And those could include multiple FPGAs or single FPGA based systems. And it could be a kind of specific semiconductor technology that you would be interested in exploring, things like that. The product is called Visual Sim Architect, which is a completely graphical modeling and simulation platform. And this tool helps in bridging the gap between specification and implementation flow itself. If you notice, uh, if you consider any of the specification related tools, maybe uh, they could be based on UML based approach, you can clearly capture uh, your visibility of your system itself and try to understand how a system topology can be defined and uh, what are the design requirements, things like that, that you can capture very uh, clearly. Coming to implementation tools such as Vivado or MATLAB or Symbolink, things like that. So you can uh, capture very, very detailed information, but uh, it takes a kind of a couple of months to reach to that level itself. So clearly we can see a kind of uh, gap between your specification to implementation and we help in uh, bridging that gap by 
constructing your specification model and simulating those specification models by providing varieties of uh, parameters and uh, configurations that you would be uh, going to give it as a feedback to the implementation teams itself. And the tool is provided with lots and lots of uh, uh, library blocks and the library blocks are provided both in terms of stochastic and uh, uh, cycle accurate library blocks based on uh, the level of accuracy or based on the level of details that you have, you can start off with modeling. For example, you are trying to identify or trying to define a topology for your system architecture, then you can start off with a stochastic level modeling approach, which is a kind of uh, statistical or queuing level models, which you can construct within a uh, few minutes to a few hours, things like that. So that actually enables you to capture details such as how you should define your topology and what are the kind of uh, design elements that you should consider and try to understand if the project is feasible or not. And then the next level of modeling approach or modeling abstraction that Visual Sim enables you to uh, construct is cycle accurate level modeling. This mo level of modeling enables you to kind of uh, conduct very detailed analysis of your memory subsystem or a processor subsystem itself, or it could be a networking a topology that you're, or networking arbitration scheme that you're trying to explore and things like that. So the level of abstractions can be purely decided based on uh, the level of details and the kind of explorations that you would be interested in doing. On the high level, uh, the types of analysis and the types of uh, explorations that you would be doing uh, is architecture exploration, which is selection of your architecture elements, which processor you should select, which memory you should select, and what is the configuration that you should go with, things like that. And then a uh, performance analysis itself. So performance analysis means you could try to understand what is the end-to-end -end latency that you are getting for a particular application on a particular platform, and what is the throughput that you are getting, and what is the utilization of various uh, hardware elements that you have in your platform itself, whether uh, the selected platform is going to perform for your current requirements or maybe five years down the line or 10 years down the line requirements, things like that. And in addition to that, uh, the same simulation model can be used to conduct power analysis as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples on that side as well. And one of the very interesting uh, topic uh, many of, of our customers are coming across is hardware software partitioning itself. And I will be actually showing a couple of examples during this event itself to show you how you can use Visual Sim for conducting hardware software partition. Considering uh, Zinc 7000 itself, what are the kind of applications that you would be running on your application processors as opposed to your uh, configurable logic itself. Okay, the list of libraries that uh, that are provided with Visual Sim includes a uh, hardware modeling libraries, as I mentioned earlier, processors, memories, and interconnects, things like that, and also libraries for modeling your software behavior flow and network and traffic generations, things like that, and also libraries for capturing your reports and uh, try to generate some use cases for the implementation teams as well. And the tool is completely graphical and hierarchical, which means uh, you don't have to learn a new uh, language or things like that to uh, get started with your modeling work itself. So why exactly a performance modeling or performance analysis of FPGA-based systems with Visual Sim is crucial? If you look at uh, Xilinx Zinc 7000 on programmable SOC, it provides hardware software partitioning or hardware software implementation engine with ample of uh, on-chip resources capable of handling complex designs, things like that. And also these resources include uh, uh, your very powerful ARM Cortex A9 processors and uh, you have memories, flash controllers, DMA controllers, things like that. And uh, you will definitely need a, a kind of architecture exploration platform to be able to exploit uh, the abundance of these hardware architectural resources uh, to be able to get better performance and uh, to achieve uh, 
power requirements as well. So you need to have an uh, insight into how hardware and software balance will actually affect the workload itself. If you consider uh, the image that I have shown in the right hand side over here, if we consider uh, implementation of an open flow switch or OVS switch on an FPGA with just one PCI Express or two PCI Express with an uh, Ethernet interface, things like that, and then designing such a system could be very simple. And, uh, uh, the selection of required amount of IP blocks would be very straightforward. So you don't have to stress out a lot to identify which IP block I should go and select and how many instances of it I should be selecting. If you have multiple instances of or multiple uh, interfaces like PCI Express or Ethernet, things like that, then I'll be having multiple streams of data going across my board itself and I might be having a lot of uh, data dependencies between multiple streams as well. And also, I may have uh, issues in terms of scheduling and arbitrating all these multiple streams of data across my board itself and I may actually uh, face some of the issues in terms of dropping off a packet of information inside your uh, FPGA itself instead of uh, sending all the data across without any performance issues. So these kind of problems that you could try or that you could expect uh, if you uh, start developing very complex uh, system architectures and in, uh, FPGAs like Zinc 7000 or maybe other FPGAs itself. So to give you a feel about how a uh, Visual C model will look like and how you can try to understand these kind of problems and how you can eliminate uh, the challenges as early as possible in the design process, I would like to go over to Visual Sim tool right now. You should be able to see it in a minute. And here we have a Visual Sim Architect tool itself. And uh, the white space that you can see in the middle is actually the uh, place, work, workplace where you can uh, uh, construct your simulation models by dragging and dropping your library blocks from the left hand side. And also each library blocks can be configured or provided with its own customized uh, parameters as well to, to be able to explore your architecture uh, while exploring your analysis, things like that. For example, if I double click on this particular LB block, which is actually an IP, so I have a certain set of parameters such as how many cycles this particular IP blocks is going to take. And if I look at this particular OVS switch, it is again a hierarchical block and if I go inside that, I can see a set of uh, blocks that actually made a complete uh, a crossbar switch along with multiple decisions that I'm uh, taking across over here. And consider this is a, a statistical model which is constructed uh, within uh, two to three hours. And the purpose of co constructing this particular model is, is to understand how many instances of uh, these IP blocks I should consider, uh, I should be having uh, to be able to transfer uh, the data from my four PCI Express, which is actually connected to a host PC, things like that, um, without losing any data, things like that. And when I run the simulation for this particular model, I actually capture reports in multiple formats. Uh, it is in textual formats as well as in graphical formats. And uh, again, the reports can be customizable and custom uh, based on what exactly you're looking up uh, from the uh, model itself or from the explorations that you're con uh, conducting itself. And if you look at the top left, top right corner graph, here we can see a kind of lot of packets are dropped off uh, from LB block, which is actually an IP, and then uh, DPI and forward, things like that. These are the kind of uh, ele functional elements those are rejecting or those are uh, from, from which the packet of information are dropping off. So what I can do is, this actually tells me that the amount of resources that I have that I'm using in my FPGA itself is not sufficient enough to process out all the data across my OVS switch itself. So what I can do here is uh, 
I was using only one instances of all these uh, elements, and I found that if we ha if I have six elements, six instances of these IP elements, then I would be having uh, lossless transmissions across my uh, board itself. So if I go ahead and change the parameters and run the simulation again, I can actually see a lot of activities are happening across my uh, a flow itself. For example, in this case, I'm capturing the latency for my request flow from uh, host PC to Ethernet Mac itself. And uh, I can see a lot of activities that are going across. And also, I can see uh, the number of packet drops is almost is exactly nil now, which means I don't have any kind of rejections or dropping of packets in my uh, uh, FPGA platform itself. So this is kind of very high level exploration of your system platform. This may not be very accurate, but what you can do is this actually provides you a significant amount of information about what exactly is happening and what you should be doing. So once you have sufficient information, you can actually go ahead and start putting in a detailed information of your IP uh, functionality of these IP blocks itself and model your real uh, DDR, cycle accurate DDR memories itself and uh, bringing in PCI Express and Ethernet Mac interfaces, things like that. So that way you can actually start off with nothing and then you can actually explore or extend your system to your uh, very detailed simulation model itself. So now I'm going to go back to uh, presentation right now. So if we just look at the performance of a particular system, that, that will not be sufficient enough to decide architectural elements uh, that you'll be selecting for your architecture itself or for your proposed system architecture itself. So you should be looking at both power as well as power uh, performance requirements of, uh, of your proposed system as well. One of the kind of uh, very common or very famous uh, uh, tool that, that is being used for conducting power analysis is spreadsheets. But spreadsheets actually provide you uh, static information about your system itself and that can provide you power, uh, average power information with a spe specific configuration of your FPGA or specific configurations of your uh, hardware architecture itself with a specific workload. And you will not be able to capture the dynamic behavior of your system architecture, that could definitely change uh, your power consumption. Maybe at certain time stamp, it, uh, the power consumption uh, may go really high. And that spike can cause uh, performance issues or it can uh, completely shut down your system or things like that. If you look at the uh, image that I'm showing right, right here, in this case, actually, we are capturing the average power consumption, which is actually collected from a sp particular spreadsheet, which is actually uh, plotted in a graph. And later on, after a time period, uh, the power consumption of, of this particular system is started going up. This actually tells that uh, the spreadsheet information or static information of uh, power details are not sufficient enough to make design decisions in terms of power management. So you should you should also capture dynamic behavior and also you should try to understand at what is the state at which your devices are in, whether the device is in active state or standby state or uh, idle state, things like that. You should be looking at all these varieties of uh, states of your devices and accordingly try to understand what is the total power consumption that is happening across your board itself. So this actually tells that divergence of analytical methods uh, can cause incorrect expectations, but definitely you should be having a tool that can actually uh, provide you information on dynamic uh, uh, activities that are happening across your board itself. So with that uh, little bit of background on the challenges and the need for performance analysis of a particular Zinc 7000 or a similar uh, FPGA platform itself, now let's uh, look at what exactly you can do with Visual Sim Zinc 7000 architectural sub solution and what kind of analysis or what, what you can get out of this particular solution itself. So one of the crucial aspects that uh, our customers are uh, 
achieving out of uh, visual sim zinc 7000 uh, solution is partitioning of uh, your system based on uh, where you want to run your applications whether you want to run on your hardware whether you want to run on software so by looking at both performance as well as power consumption and uh, to be able to provide you uh, accurate values we will be actually uh, the model has been constructed or the solution is constructed uh, completely in cycle accurate mode and also it takes multiple ways of defining workloads uh, that is being mapped onto the target platform itself. Now also apart from that, uh, user can identify uh, varieties of uh, uh, metrics out of your simulation models itself or with a different set of workloads itself and you can try to understand whether your system is gonna work fine uh, if if the latency is uh, very high or if the power consumption is very high so which kind of or what kind of uh, uh, dis design decisions that you should be taking up and also apart from that it actually helps you to understand uh, or helps you to define uh, the buffer requirements for your uh, programmable logic uh, that you are going to implement on your programmable logic itself. And also you can try to understand what is the interface rate at which you should be running uh, without uh, losing any data or without uh, compromising in terms of performance of your complete system platform itself. And uh, the Zinc 7000 uh, model or, or the solution actually includes all, the, it is exactly compliant with uh, Zinc 7000 uh, uh, specification itself and uh, it includes a dual core ARM Cortex A9 processor and it includes uh, memories and uh, DMA controllers and timers and the interrupt controllers. And also it includes a pro programmable logic to be able to model your custom requirements as well. Um, please note that uh, this particular solution is not really for uh, software debugging or application software debugging. So that's why you will not be able to run your operating system on top of this particular platform itself. And uh, the solution is purely for conducting architecture exploration and performance analysis and power analysis uh, and bottleneck analysis, things like that. And here is uh, here is the kind of uh, Visual Sim Zinc 7000 model or the solution that we are offering, and this includes a set of uh, interfaces which is actually on the left hand side over here, and also it includes the hardware platform with uh, um, Cortex A9 uh, processor dual core, and uh, we also have uh, Snoop control and Watchdog timers and interrupt controllers, things like that. And, and also we have the memories connected to uh, uh, the central inter interconnect or AXI bus. And also we have the programmable logic on which you would be uh, modeling or you, or you would be implementing your custom requirements, things like that. And the behavior flows actually enables you to define your uh, workloads itself and from where the data is going across and what is the size of the data that you are sending it. and uh, what, what, what kind of uh, priorities that you uh, that you are uh, working with, things like that. I'll be showing you a demo for the, on that examples as well. And if you consider a simple example on image processing system, and the kind of attributes that uh, we would be considering includes uh, the sensor rate or data rate or uh, the data rate of any other uh, interconnects that you that you have connected be it a CAN, be it a UART, be it a USB, things like that. And apart from that uh, you can define what is the frame size as this is the image processing system we are talking about and uh, I, I need to define what is the frame size that I'm talking about and the kind of functions that I have implemented on my uh, programmable logic or uh, which is defined as a sequence of tasks, I would say, includes ISPs and read frame, decode frame, video post processor, rendering, and things like that. And the implementation uh, can be done either on ARM core or a fabric, or it can be done on a combination of uh, uh, ARM core plus fabric itself. I'm gonna show you a, a demonstration to give you an idea about how performance and power uh, values are completely uh, different uh, with different approaches of implementation itself. 
okay? And uh, the behavior flow is defined as a task graph to map all the uh, applications or tasks onto the target platform. And if you see over here, we have uh, at the bottom, we have the image processing system uh, task graph, or we call it as application sequence. It actually started off with a transaction generator, which actually behaves as a, a generator of a particular sense of values. It generates a set of values. Well, it says, oh, which is your source, what is the name of your source, what is the name of your destination, and what is the size of the data that you're talking about, and what is the priority that you're talking about, things like that. And then apart from that, we have split it up multiple tasks here, read frame, decode frame, video post processing, things like that. And I can map all these individual tasks to a particular processor platform. For example, if you see over here in this particular window, the destination I have specified as any core, which means the operating system or the scheduler which is defined in the model decides uh, either uh, this particular task needs to be mapped to a processor one or processor two. If you want to send these tasks to a particular processor core, you can uh, provide those details as well. And also you can provide other details such as what is the priority uh, this particular task uh, that should be provided with. When you have a higher priority task, your processor will actually uh, stall for that particular time period and it takes up uh, the higher priority tasks and start executing it. And, it. and this particular window can be, again, uh, configured and you can add as many as application flows that you want to have and uh, uh, map your application onto either uh, Zinc uh, either your programmable logic or you can map it onto your uh, application processors itself. And the kind of behavior analysis that you could expect or that you can capture out of this particular simulation model, again, purely depends on what you're looking for. If you are looking for, uh, if you are trying to understand if, if your particular application has been modeled or implemented on a Zinc 7000 and you would be expecting the total system power consumption should not be going above three watts or in, it should return so much uh, performance figures and it should provide uh, uh, so much throughput values, uh, then you can try to understand or try to capture only those part of your reports and try to understand what is really going on. Okay, so I actually, I'm gonna show you couple of analysis now and uh, in this particular image processing platform that I just talked about um, I'm actually having a requirement such as a processing of about 9,000 macro blocks of uh, image or video uh, macro blocks that needs to be processed about 9,000 and I should be having a total system power consumption of less than 3 watts of power and initially what we are doing is we'll be actually running everything on on the application processor itself so running all our isp read frame decode video post processing rendering and all that all the all these tasks are directly mapped onto the application processor itself which means running a system as a software part of your system itself and we have noticed that the number of macro block processing is actually about 1,643, whereas uh, system power consumption is about 2.6 2 watts. Even though power consumption is actually meeting our requirements, performance is very poor. At this point, I'm going to switch over to VisualSense to be able to show you uh, how the model has been assembled. And here is uh, here is the Zinc 7000 uh, programmable SOC model as a solution uh, that we have here. And again, as I mentioned earlier, here we have varieties of interfaces that are gonna go with your Zinc 7000 itself, and you can connect as many as uh, different workloads to your Zinc 7000 itself based on your requirement. And I have my processor cores, which are provided with various uh, configurable parameters. If you wish, you can change those parameter va values as well. And also, if you look at these uh, different memory blocks, memories are provided with configurable uh, uh, libraries, and you can change the uh, configuration of these memory blocks as well. And here, we actually have the power manager, which actually enables me to capture power consumption reports for my 
uh, complete system and uh, for the applications that I'm running on top of this particular uh, Zing 7000 model itself. And if I double click on this power manager, I actually see a set of values that I have defined over here. For example, for process of one, at active state, I have said that the power consumption is going to be about 1.9 watts and standby state it is going to be about 0.5 watts of power consumption. And similarly, I have defined for varieties of other uh, uh, hardware blocks that I have, hardware resources that I have in my platform itself. And this can be an Excel spreadsheet that you, that you may have in front of you and you can directly import it over here. Purpose of defining this particular uh, power table over here is uh, whenever something is executing on your processor or maybe other memories or maybe other blocks, it actually pushes that particular device to active state from a standby state or off state. So as soon as it enters your active state or st standby state, it actually starts updating the power consumption that is being happening for, for a given time period. So uh, on the fly, the power consumption of, all of, of, of your complete system will be computed uh, and also power consumption values for uh, individual re resources also be provided uh, as part of the simulation results itself. And one thing that you would be uh, asking right now is what about the behavior or what about the application that I should be running on this platform? Well, the application that you should be running on this platform can be mapped, uh, mapped into it in multiple ways. One thing is that if you already have your C or C++ code, which is actually uh, written in terms of uh, uh, kind of software code or software application, you can directly import that. Or if you want to run that particular software code or, or, or your application on a particular uh, processor platform and to generate uh, instruction sequence or trace file out of it, you can import that uh, trace file as part of your uh, behavior flow as well or your application itself. Otherwise, if you don't have uh, your application software written or if you don't have uh, any algorithm written, you can actually model those uh, decisions or uh, application uh, sequence as a kind of flow diagram over here. If you look at over here, this particular transaction generator is actually generating uh, traffic at a certain time period. And if you look at this particular task, and if I go inside this, this is actually modeled using a very simple uh, processing plus mapper block. So Mapper is actually a visual sim provides you to be able to map your applications onto the target platform that you have uh, defined uh, in your architecture itself. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is, at this point is I'm gonna go ahead and run the model. It actually takes uh, a couple of minutes to complete the simulation, so I will not be running for, for the complete time period. The simulation reports provides you information on uh, the average power consumption or instantaneous power consumption of your complete system. In this case, I'm capturing average power consumption of my com uh, simulation platform or, or, or the simulation model. And the graph that you're seeing on the right-hand side corner is actually the interrupt uh, act activities that are happening across my board itself. This actually tells me which in, uh, interrupt is actually active and what uh, which task is actually being executed on my platform itself. This actually helps you to debug your simulation uh, platform to be able to understanding uh, whether uh, a particular task is serviced in a uh, particular time period or it is taking more than uh, the desired amount of uh, cycles, process cy uh, cycles that you have been expecting. And also, in addition to that, you can uh, try to understand other information such as what exactly the data coming out of a particular uh, uh, port of your uh, I.O. interface or things like that. So that actually tells you or provides you information on whether you are getting exactly the same data which you have uh, sent out to your processing platform itself. Okay. So I'm going to stop this uh, simulation for now. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, in this case, I actually ran this particular model uh, considering all the applications or all the tasks running on my uh, ARM core itself. So that I have defined inside my 
Um, for example, if I go inside here, and if I look at that particular uh, scheduler name or to be uh, to where I'm sending the data, it actually is it is sending it to a processor thread, which is actually uh, behaving as an operating system or a scheduler for my uh, application itself. So at this point, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to looking at the report again. I was actually expecting about 9,000 uh, macro blocks that needs to be processed and power consumption should be under one watt. But when I look at the part, I'm going to go back to uh, the presentation right now. I, when I look at the number of macro blocks that, that are being processed, uh, instead of 9,000, I'm actually, I can see only about 1,600 uh, 43 macro blocks are processed, which is very less. When we actually looked at the activities that are happening across across the platform, we actually found that the rotate, rotate frame uh, task is actually taking a lot of CPU cycles itself. So this actually tells me that it is a good idea to move over uh, rotate frame tasks to a particular uh, or a dedicated hardware accelerator itself. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to move this rotate frame task from uh, processor or from software to hardware part of my system itself. When I double click on this particular platform, I have already configured this particular model for that. I'm going to move over this particular task from software to hardware, which means I have my programmable logic over here. And if I go inside that programmable logic, I have my uh, hardware accelerator, which is actually defined over here. So from now onwards, my rotate frame task is going to be executing on my hardware accelerator itself. So again, when I go ahead and run the simulation for the uh, configurations that I just changed, again, I'll be looking at uh, this activities that are happening across my board itself and try to understand whether power consumption is under uh, 3 watts and trying to understand whether uh, the performance that you're expecting is uh, is met or not. If I look at the number of macro blocks being processed, it is about 11,783, which is actually quite good. But if I look at the average power consumption that I'm looking at for uh, for my complete system board, it is actually going above 3 watts. So which actually tells me that performance is met, but power consumption of my complete system platform is actually quite high. So this actually tells me that something is wrong in my system platform. And when I look at the activities that are happening for my hardware engine itself, the power consumption of my uh, hardware engine, I can actually see that the hardware engine is actually in on state all the time, which is actually completely wrong. And I should turn off my hardware engine whenever uh, the processing is done. So what I can do is I can introduce a power gating algorithm to make sure that if there are no tasks that is, that is being processed on my platform, I should turn that particular device to a idle state or things like that. Again, you will be actually changing the configuration and running the simulation to be able to understanding uh, whether uh, the performance that you're getting or expecting is met or the total power consumption that you're expecting is met or not. And you will be actually looking at the power consumption. It is actually still, it is showing up something like 2.6. And uh, micro blocks processing about 10,000 uh, macro blocks that is being processed. So this actually tells me that I'm actually meeting both in terms of performance as well as my power consumption is being met by conducting this particular exploration itself. So in addition to that, what else you can conduct in terms of analysis is you can try to understand whether my zinc board can take other additional interfaces. Uh, can I connect multiple or uh, maybe one more USB or maybe one more I2C or UART or gigabit Ethernet itself uh, without uh, impact, without making any other uh, passive impact on, on the platform which I'm actually running uh, right now. So 
to show that actually what I did was I actually increased my uh, USB data rate from 32 Mbps to 60 Mbps which actually tells me that the data rate is quite high right now and uh, uh, there are a lot of activities that is going to be happening on my platform itself. So this actually gave me a kind of error report saying that uh, your RTOS or, or your scheduler itself is actually not capable of handling too much traffic. So this actually gives an information to the designer saying that you should restrict your uh, interface data rates to a particular speed to be able to run your system uh, without any failure or without uh, making any passive impacts on the total system power or performance requirements itself. Okay. And at this point, I would like to show you a kind of one more example to be able to show you the ability to model a, a very complex system platform itself. And I'm going to again go back to Visual Sim right now. Oops. So the purpose of showing you this particular example is. Uh, modeling of uh, very complex systems with multiple boards or multiple uh, subsystems which you want to integrate together and you want to uh, interface them and uh, and try to understand if uh, if the if, if you find any kind of uh, synchronization issues between your multiple subsystems or multiple boards itself and in this case what you're seeing right now here is you have a CPU board and you have an option board which is actually connected to it uh, across or using a PCI Express it's, itself and in this case what we have over here we actually have an ARM uh, uh, subsystem itself with our memories and uh, other interfaces and we also have other interfaces maybe coming out from a, a separate subsystem or it could be coming from a uh, sensor or something like that which is actually uh, connected to the PCI Express itself and uh, the processing of the data which is coming across could be done in ARM subsystem over here or you can send that over to another op optional board which you have connected uh, across your PCI Express itself and you can actually construct a very uh, complex a system something like that to understand uh, the synchronization issues that are happening between your multiple FPGAs or uh, between multiple uh, single board com computers or things like that. Okay. And uh, at this point you would be having a question saying that uh, can I model a particular FPGA without having any application processors in it? So to show you that example, I'm going to go over to Visual Sim again. And uh, the example that you're looking at right now is uh, Vertex 5 PGA board itself, and uh, in which actually I have a PowerPC uh, soft core processor, which is actually modeled inside that. And also I have a memory controller model, which is actually uh, in interfaced or which is actually talking to the external memory which is connected to uh, Vertex 5 PGA itself and also it has uh, interfaces or it has the data which is coming from Ethernet and PCI Express itself and also it has uh, uh, DMA operations that are being performed on receiving the data from your interfaces itself and you can in, instead of having any kind of soft core processors you can model uh, purely uh, the application behaviors or uh, other kind of control algorithms that you would be trying to explore uh, with a particular FPGA itself to be able to understand whether the selected FPGA is going to work for your current and future requirements. And these components are actually uh, provided as part of the library blocks and uh, please note that uh, it is almost impossible to provide uh, the fabric level details uh, which actually in turn makes you uh, kind of gate level modeling and all that. But uh, what we provide is we actually provide you a facility to model your uh, functional uh, models of, of the applications that you are going to uh, implement on your FPGA itself. And this actually provides you information on whether the selected FPGA is going to meet your requirements or uh, you should be selecting a 
higher configuration or whether you should be selecting a lower configuration of the processor based on your requirement itself. Okay, and at this point I'm going to go back to uh, the presentation. And uh, as you have seen now uh, with some of the examples that I was showing right now with uh, by changing the kind of configurations or by changing the parameters in my simulation model, uh, this has actually been done in, in a tool called Visual Sim Archetype, which I, which I just showed you. So that one, you can actually construct in, uh, internally and you can try to explore multiple uh, configuration of the platforms and all that. Consider if you are working with multiple teams, maybe uh, they are sitting in a um, they are sitting in multiple cities or you want to interact with your clients or suppliers to be able to understand a particular requirement or uh, specifications, things like that. We actually have a tool called Visual Sim Explorer that actually enables you to export all your simulation model as a HTML page itself and uh, you can upload these HTML pages or, or the simulation model into your central server and the person who is actually interested in looking at this particular simulation model can actually access this uh, HTML page and try to run uh, simulation right from the web browser and uh, instead of just reading uh, some white papers and all that, they can really see uh, the activities that are going across the uh, board with the different set of configurations itself. So to conclude this particular uh, presentation or webinar, uh, the purpose of conducting early architectural exploration or performance analysis of a system such as a system with Zinc 7000 or multiple uh, Zinc 7000, it is purely to evaluate and uh, validate the system specifications in terms of performance and power requirements and also to understand uh, the possible bottlenecks that you could expect uh, maybe uh, later in the design process or maybe after implementation itself. And also you can try to understand the architectural issues around hardware and software partitioning itself. So as you, as you have seen in the simulation model that I was going across, when I actually ported my application from a software to hardware, I actually initially saw that Performance was very good, but power consumption was uh, very high. So this actually tells you that where do you want to edit or where do you want to change in your specification itself and what kind of uh, modifications that you should be doing for your uh, architecture itself. And also this tells you whether you uh, if, if you run your applications on the hardware, whether that is going to be your uh, uh, kind of uh, provides you better in terms of performance or maybe in terms of cost wise things like that or you should be running it on a software. So these kind of explorations you can uh, conduct uh, early in the design phase itself just that without having any RTL core or without having application software ready itself. And, and also apart from that um, you can explore um, uh, you can try to understand the impact of your performance versus uh, power consumption of your complete system platform itself. And if a particular uh, component is consuming a lot of power, power, you can try to understand why that particular device is consuming more power and you can try to optimize those kind of uh, challenges uh, early in the design phase itself. Okay, so this concludes this particular webinar and I thank you all for, for your uh, presence. And uh, I'm going to go over to Q&A session right now and I'm going to answer the questions that are being asked. asked. So there is a question on uh, how do you get power and utilization numbers uh, for programmable logic portion itself. So the answer is uh, 
we can actually strike, I mean, uh, get the power consumption values for uh, for application processors and other part of my hardware logic that I have in my Zinc 7000, which is actually, which can be captured from the data sheet. Uh, with regards to programmable logic itself, we actually go with an approach of uh, looking at activities uh, that are being happening in the platform itself. So when I define a particular logic in, in the programmable logic, uh, we actually have a special functions to push a particular uh, state, uh, particular, uh, sorry, uh, to be able to push particular component to a particular state, whether uh, if you receive something or if you receive some tasks that that is, that is going to be executed on my program logic, I, sh I will immediately uh, push that uh, device state from uh, state standby state to active state or uh, maybe from once it is over, I can push active state to standby state. This actually can be done uh, using our expression languages that we are offering. Uh, the purpose of using those expression languages is because the programmable logic is most of a kind of custom components that you should be uh, or you will be using. Uh, that's why uh, it would be very difficult to get uh, uh, power information from any data sheets or anything like that. So what do we do is we actually go with an approach of looking at the activity that is or state of that particular component or particular logic that I have uh, that I have implemented on a programmable logic itself. So this actually provides us uh, quite a good number of power values in, uh, for my uh, programmable logic itself. And in terms of utilization, uh, uh, we actually concentrate more on the uh, the, the BRAMs that you should be, that you have in your uh, programmable logic itself, or maybe other uh, other. Uh, components, maybe uh, soft core processors, things like that. And these values are directly generated out of the tool. And uh, if you have any kind of additional logics that is that is being mapped or modeled using custom uh, library blocks of VisualSim, we actually provide a, a regex expressions to, to be able to update uh, the utilization activities that are being uh, sorry, utilization of uh, various resources itself. So we actually look at how many number of transactions came through and how many exited and what is the rate at which the transactions are going across that particular board itself. And based on these activities, we will actually capture the utilization numbers for uh, the programmable logic itself. So I hope uh, I have answered your question. So there is one more question on uh, uh, can you elaborate on transaction generator or a C model uh, code to be imported? So the transaction generator, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to VisualSim right now. So I'm going to show you a simple example here. For example, or maybe much more simpler, if you look at the library block that I just dragged in, so we have this, these are varieties of different traffic generators. And this particular simple traffic generator, when I double click on that, it actually provides me a set of values. This actually, sorry, this actually tells me what is the interval, what is the time interval between every transfer that is being generated. And I, I can provide, uh, I can say that I, can, I, I will be generating a particular task for every one second. And uh, that, that actually acts as a trigger. And when I look at this particular block over here for Ethernet traffic itself, so what I have over here is I have a set of tasks that are being defined or uh, or, or the details that I have defined in, in that particular traffic generator. I have details such as what is the size of the data and what is the command type and uh, what is the name of the source and to where I'm sending the transactions to. And this actually tells me uh, that I'm actually sending a data with 500 bytes of data and which is actually a write and I'm actually writing it to an SDRAM itself. So this is a very simple approach of defining the traffic uh, workload for my application itself. And you can make it much more complex by using our scripting languages itself, uh, which you can see here. 
This actually used it for a, a monitor, but you can actually define your uh, transaction details or the workload details that you that you that you are going to model or uh, that you will be giving for your system model itself. So this is exactly like a C language. You can define your transaction details or traffic details in this particular model itself. So typically transaction details or it would be the name of the source, name of the destination, and what is the priority that uh, you are handling. And uh, and apart from that, you may have what is the address and what is the uh, kind of priority that you are working with, things like that. Those are the things that you can define using a scripting language or using our basic building blocks. So coming to your question on uh, using a C model code, uh, uh, I would like to show you a simple model right now. For example, in this case, this is actually for an AutoSAR uh, ECU node processor. And uh, if I go inside these runnables or ECU node itself, we have uh, runnables, software runnables. And if I go there, we actually have interface to uh, C interface itself. In this case, it is actually a very simple speed calculation. And we are actually directly using uh, the code that is actually written for computing uh, speed of a particular wheel or something like that. So this is one application. You can directly import your uh, C code into your simulation model. And the other approach is we actually have a concept of uh, importing uh, the trace files to Visual Sim uh, Architect itself. To show you that uh, requirement, I'm going to show you a simple example right now. And in this case, uh, I'm actually looking at implementing my AES uh, algorithm on dual core ARM7 um, platform itself. If you look at the top side, this actually defines my uh, hardware platform itself with uh, dual ARM7. Um, and at the bottom, I have my software architecture. Note that here, I don't have any kind of uh, task flow diagram or any application sequence that I have defined. But instead of that, I'm actually reading a particular file from here. So in this case, I'm actually reading a trace file for my TDMI itself. And uh, the trace file is actually generated uh, by looking at, we actually provide a uh, annotation file itself. And we actually try to insert a couple of fields into the C code that you have. And when we compile that, uh, compile your C code with the annotation file, what we have, we will be actually generating a trace file uh, specific for the processor that you are using itself. For example, in this case, the trace file is generated for ARM7. And uh, it actually has a series of uh, instructions the, or mnemonics that I'll be running on my platform itself. And apart from that, what we have is we also have a concept of profiler-based instruction generator. So which actually enables you to, uh, if you don't have any uh, application software or anything like that, you can actually define your application uh, or you can, you can generate inst instructions out of a profiler-based uh, tool. And here what happens here is uh, for a particular processor, uh, maybe it is you're talking about uh, ARM Cortex or maybe Intel processor or things like that, you can define uh, varieties of uh, units that you have, whether logical unit or arithmetic unit or branch instruction, things like that. You will have to list out all the mnemonics that are coming under those categories. And uh, we actually provide uh, these uh, tables predefined for varieties of processors such as ARM, uh, raw PC processors and Intel processors and uh, things like that. And if you are uh, working with a custom processor, you will be actually have to define all these uh, mnemonics. And at the bottom here, you will actually define various tasks that, that you're going to uh, define. For example, in this case, for image rendering, and uh, if you look at your image rendering uh, application code itself, you may have a series of uh, loops or series of functions that you're going to implement. And out of those things, you can uh, generate, maybe you can generate around 600 instructions. And uh, 
out of 600 instructions, uh, it could be about 20% of logical instructions and about 20% uh, uh, of uh, uh, load and store instructions, things like that. You can you can define these uh, kind of assumptions as a as a table format here. And uh, again, uh, this purely depends on uh, uh, what e what exactly you're gonna run and what exact what kind of applications that you're trying to working with. And this definitely requires some amount of uh, information on uh, uh, on your application software itself and uh, to be able to understand or to be able to provide or collect information on what would be the aggregated uh, number of instructions that you could generate when you run a particular uh, application uh, code on a particular processor. So this actually provides a sequence of instructions and that is being mapped onto the target platform. And again, uh, looking at the target platform when I say processor, we actually have a processor generator and uh, this is completely configurable and it is not uh, defined to run your operating system or your real application software on top of these particular processors, but instead of that, this is purely for conducting architecture explorations to be able to understand what is the performance that you're getting when you run a particular code on your processor code itself. And this takes uh, information such as what is the clock speed that you're working with and what is the cache execution units and uh, uh, what happens if there is a cache miss and where you are going to get the data, things like that. And also it takes uh, uh, details on pipeline stages as well. So consider uh, the purpose of having this particular processor model uh, is to actually understand uh, the challenges in terms of memory access schemes and uh, memory access related problems itself. So how long it takes to get the data from an external cache or maybe external memory uh, to your processor uh, to be able to execute without any kind of stalls or things like that. Okay, I hope I answered your question. So our, um, our engineers are being uh, answering for your questions as well. And if there are any kind of questions that are being missed out, uh, we will be sending a list with uh, all the questions and answers that are being asked during this event itself. So thanks a lot for your time and uh, thank you very much for, for your presence and uh, uh, interesting questions. Oh, have a great day.